from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. USDA making some slight changes to the supply and demand picture in the U.S. and South America this week. Well, another one that's not getting much attention, I think, is in the Black Sea region. How does it change price projections in the months ahead? A drop in net farm income? USDA's first official release of net farm income projections this year confirms farmers' fears. Market analysts are actually bullish on beef. We're probably down to about half the number of cows from where we were a couple years ago. But what else could cattle producers wade through this year? That's our Farm Journal report. The science behind the Super Bowl turf. Turf grass breeding program really has focused on developing varieties that are tough. And in John's world. Egg prices may have a sunny side. Now for the news, we'll have recent weather issues impacted South American crops. USDA putting numbers on paper in the latest supply and demand report issued this week. Let's first get to the latest U.S. numbers and ending stocks with corn ending stocks higher thanks to a 25 million bushel reduction in corn for ethanol demand. But exports were unchanged. Now for soybeans, the projection is for lower crush and higher ending stocks, but no change to exports. So ending stocks are up 15 million. And for wheat, supplies are largely unchanged with ending stocks raised 1 million bushels. Now now, USDA left Brazilian production estimates unchanged at 125 million metric tons for corn and 153 million metric tons for soybeans. The big cuts, those came in Argentina as the area battles weeks of dryness. USDA was fairly aggressive, dropping corn production 5 million metric tons to 47 million. Soybean production was cut 4.5 million to 41 million metric tons. We'll talk more about those numbers coming up in our roundtables. Well, there may finally be a diplomatic solution to end Mexico's plan to ban imports of U.S. GMO corn, with reports that Mexico will soon publish a new decree that will keep U.S. corn exports flowing into the country. Mexico's Secretary of Economy now saying if the Federal Commission for Protection Against Sanitary Risk determines U.S. GMO corn is not a threat to human health, then it will have no problem entering Mexico. He says the new decree will address U.S. concerns as well. As reported last week, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai threatened Mexico during their latest meeting that the U.S could take Mexico to task through a dispute settlement panel under the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. And if Mexico moved forward with plans to ban GMO corn by 2024. Well, USDA is proposing updates to the school nutrition standards, and the dairy industry is weighing in on possible changes to how milk and what flavored milk is served. Currently, some 30 million students eat school lunch. USDA is proposing more whole grains with flexibility for pasta or tortillas once a week. It's pushing to cut salt by up to 30 percent, reduced gradually and now through 2029. And it's asking for feedback on changes to low fat flavored milk. Now, one idea would leave milk as is. Another would limit low fat flavored milk to just older students, eliminating things like chocolate milk for elementary school kids. The goal is to reduce added sugars. The International Dairy Foods Association telling us if that happens, the end result will be fewer kids eating lunch. Studies have been done in schools in Colorado and New Mexico and Arizona and schools throughout the country. When you remove flavored milk from the school meals menu, you get less participation in the meals program and you get kids consuming less food. When you add it back, those numbers return, they rebound. You get more kids participating. You get them consuming more food, so there's less waste. And why is that important if you're a parent? Because the kids are getting more nutrients, the nutrients that they need. He says the milk currently served in the schools already meets the new proposal's sugar requirements, adding that flavored milk offers 13 essential nutrients. The improvement in farmer sentiment at the end of last year appears to have carried into the new year. That's according to a new CME group, Purdue University Ag Economy Barometer. The index rising again in January to a reading of 130. That's a four-point improvement over last year and represents an increase that's a 34 percentage point higher than the 2022 low point that was hit last June. Producers also had some interesting things to say about leasing their land for carbon sequestration. There continues to be a lot of interest in carbon contracting in agriculture. 
And in the January 23 survey, 9% of the producers in the survey reported having discussions with companies about carbon contracting on their farms. That compares to about 7% of producers who reported the same kind of discussions back in the first quarter of 2021. However, across all of our surveys, just 1% of producers report having actually signed a carbon contract. Well, those rising production costs, those are just one of the reasons that USDA is forecasting net farm income to drop 16% this year. The Economic Research Service releasing its first net farm income outlook this year, saying expenses will increase by $18.2 billion overall, an increase of more than 4% from last year. Feed expenses, those are in yellow, the largest single expense category, and it's forecast to actually fall more than 5% from last year, but interest expenses are expected to rise more than 22 percent. That's after a 42 percent increase last year. That's it for the news. Well, a warm up this past week, along with heavy rains in the south and some surprise snow in parts of the Midwest. We'll have a check of what we're watching for weather next week. That's right after the break. U.S. Farm Report is sponsored by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Steel Closing Wheels, perfected in conventional, excels in no-till. Order 12 to 16 rows today and qualify for free shipping or 20% off an end zone moisture management package. Well, more rain for the Pacific Northwest and Southeast, otherwise pretty calm across the country. Meteorologist Chuck Heaver joins us for a look. Chuck, it looks like a mild trend in terms of temperatures for most of the country is in our near future. All right, first of all, let's take a look at our drought monitor to see where we're at in the country. So you can see, obviously, in the center part of the country, that exceptional drought continues. But over in eastern Michigan, again, we have moderate to uh, dry drought for sure there. Center part of the country, exceptional. And same with down in Florida. We have some dry and moderate conditions down there. And then, of course, the western half of the country still remains either dry to moderately dry. Hopefully, we'll put a dent in that. We're going to see temperatures, though, over the next week much above normal over in the east and we have some cold air moving in from Canada and that'll bring temperatures down below normal out to the west. So it's a little bit of a seesaw here, but we're going to see that cold air slowly migrate its way across the country and a precipitation wise next week above normal for the Great Lakes area and actually most of the eastern half of the country below normal down to the southwest. Just take a look here up, especially into the Great Lakes. We're going to see a little storm push through, but overall the country is going to be relatively quiet and you can see all of the Arctic air is pushed up into Canada. And that is why the country remains relatively mild. Now this will come down. You'll see here a lobe of it will come down into the west and that'll bring colder air there. That'll kind of cut itself off and then work its way off to the east, bringing a shot of colder air down into the Great Lakes later in the week and then into the northeast near Saturday and Sunday of next weekend. But then look at this a zonal pattern again, still very mild for this time of the year. Here's a precipitation forecast. Most of this is an association with a storm that will bring a cold front through and then of course a cold front through down in the southeast. As I mentioned before, there'll be some precipitation off to the Pacific Northwest and then uh, you can see here it's going to add up a little bit down into the southeast, especially we could see precipitation totals three to five inches. All right, what about snow? Of course, up in the Appalachians, we're going to see some out in the West, we're going to see some in the Mountain West and then, of course, further up in Canada. And then here's Monday, February 13th. There's the cold front I was talking about that pushes through on Wednesday. That'll bring some precipitation along that and then a storm down to the south. That'll push along and bring some precipitation up to the East Coast. OK, that is it for your forecast. Now we're going to toss it back to Tyne. Thanks, Chuck. Well, USDA's latest report revealed some revisions to Argentina. That's due to weather, but also made some cuts to demand in the U.S. So how does it change the entire supply and demand picture? Arlen Suderman and Brian Basti join me next. Welcome back. Well, our marketing roundtable guests this weekend, Brian Bastine and Arlen Suderman. Brian, looking at the latest WASD report out of USDA, a few changes. I mean, typically this February report isn't a big market mover, but we did see a few changes, including a cut to ethanol demand. Brian, was that a surprise? No, it wasn't, Tyne. In fact, in our department here, we're actually looking for an even lower number in the months to come here. 
Uh, it isn't a dramatic decline, uh, but it's enough to, to add a few more bushels to that carryout for, for 22, 23. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see down the road as much as 25 to 50 million additional cut in that ethanol uh, balance sheet line. Arlen, we also saw some cuts to Argentina's crop left to Brazil alone. But when you look at Argentina, you look at that stretch of dry weather. You know, could there be more cuts to come? What is Stone X's official estimate at this point? Yeah, when we look at Argentina, the drought has obviously been very serious there. And some of the local estimates now are as low as about 34 and a half million metric tons. And uh, I, I can't really argue with that as we look at the weather there and uh, some of the uh, comparisons to the 2008-2009 marketing year or crop growing year. There's a lot of similarities. Uh, there's still so much up in the air yet with the late planted crops. We had about half the crop that could still really benefit from the rains that got late January and continue in February if those rains continue, although they've still been below normal and it's been warm. I think something in the 30s is probably likely. The 2008-09 crop produced 32 million metric tons. So I think it's reasonable to think that we might drop that low. But we're comparing that with a crop north of there in Brazil that could go, could, we're not there yet as far as our estimates, but could go as high as the upper 150s or maybe even 160, according to some analysis I've seen, because of how good the crops are in a center west region. So the bushels in South America as a whole are there. It's just how much can they barge down the Paraná River down to the crushing plants in Rosario to supply for the uh, soy meal and soy oil that normally comes out of Argentina. Brian, knowing that a lot could still change down in South America when it comes to that crop size, uh, you know, and, and looking at some of the changes that USDA already made, looking at those numbers today, does this week's report change your price projections any? Not really. From the standpoint of volatility, I think, time. anytime you're talking about some historically uh, low uh, carryout levels, not only domestically here in the U.S., but also looking at some world levels, we really have to look at, at, at the potential for volatility all the way through the U.S. growing season. So uh, anytime you're talking about uh, mid-February mid here in Argentina, anyway, the, the best analog I can share with your viewers is it's about mid-August in the U.S. It's, it's a kind of a rough analog, but we know how volatile things can get in mid-August with regards to soybean yields. So I'd remind your viewers that this is the time to defend your balance sheet, provide a floor underneath the market, not only for any unsold 2022 bushels they may have remaining, but also it's not too early to look ahead to these 2023 bushels. Um, a lot of attractive pricing opportunities out there already for 2023. However, if we look at the balance sheet for 23-24 time, I know that's getting ahead of ourselves a bit, but I think that the, the balance sheet for 23-24 could definitely be an increasing stock scenario, but obviously a lot of moving pieces between now and then. But I just remind the viewers that today, these are some historically high prices for new crop. Uh, so I strongly encourage them to, to consider that and look at some risk management strategies to get started if they haven't already on 23 pricing. Okay, then Arlen, short term though, when you look at that, that Brian kind of painting that picture, what could happen longer term, looking short term here, are there any possible bullish stories brewing? Well, another one that's not getting much attention, I think, is in the Black Sea region. Uh, you know, we, we built quite a risk premium in the commodity markets when Russia attacked Ukraine last February 24th. Virtually all of that risk premium has been taken out of these markets. And if anything, the risk is going up. We're seeing an escalation of risk in the Ukraine area that could further reduce commodities going out of that area. Um, Russia seems to be preparing for a spring offensive. Uh, we're also seeing talk of not only tanks from the West going into Ukraine, but now maybe fighter jets and longer range missiles. So this thing is really escalating And China, excuse me, Russia has said, we have the tools, we're a nuclear nation, we have the tools to win the war, we're not gonna lose this. So we're talking about something that's continuing to escalate and I think the commodity markets need to, need to recognize that risk. All right, what about on the demand side? I mean, are there any watch outs there or any areas of opportunity? We'll get into that later on U.S. Farm Report. Please stay with us. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Golden Harvest. Broad adaptability, high yield potential, solid agronomics, great late season health. 
The foundations of a successful season start with Golden Harvest Game Changing Corn. Find your hybrid at GameChangingCorn.com. Well, Americans are expected to eat 1.45 billion chicken wings, yes, billion, this weekend. National Chicken Council says that equates to four chicken wings for every American. But after the attention to skyrocketing egg prices, what are Americans forking over today for those eggs? Here's John Phipps. To talk today about chickens and eggs, but I, I had trouble deciding which should come first. But seriously, folks, eggs are a perfect example of an inelastic product, one that's barely sensitive to price. People buy eggs and gasoline, for examples, in almost the same amount regardless of the price. Eggs, because even at their recent peak, they weren't a grocery budget buster. Gasoline, because you need the same amount to get around to the same places despite the price. At the other end, we don't buy twice as many eggs if the price drops in half either. One driver of the egg spike wasn't just avian flu losses, but shelf life limits on any buffer supply we might have. It's not like corn in the bin. Inventory declines in like 2022 also mean eggs may not be exactly where they are needed at all times. The widely circulated numbers of chickens culled because of the disease, generally around 50 million, was never compared to total layer population of about 390 million. It was a devastating blow to individual producers and a significant portion of the flock, but the effect was spread out over the country over the year and counted by growers themselves. Per capita egg consumption has been creeping up, but too many of those graphics were designed to exaggerate more than explain. Compare these two, for example, showing the same information about per capita consumption. During 2022, the layer flock decreased 6%, and it was enough during the Christmas baking season to create spot shortages and those headline prices. The 50 million headlines never did point out avian flu is worse in older hens, about a third of which are replaced each year anyway due to their age. Eggs take about five months to use a chicken to make another egg, so flock numbers can be replenished fairly quickly, especially compared to cattle. In fact, eggs hatched for replacements are up sharply over last year. Eggs in inventory drop to low levels because egg producers balance on a knife edge since consumers will buy about the same even if eggs go back to a dollar a dozen. During all the uproar, sales dropped to about 5% last year. Such markets also can turn on a dime, so to speak. As of January 30th, that appears to be the case with eggs. From the high of over five bucks a dozen, they've dropped down to the $3 range and could drop further as inventories continue to rise. The test will be the Easter season, but it's important not to count those eggs until they are hatched. Thanks, John. Well, when we come back, we're going green in the Lone Star State. Machine Repeat has tractor tails next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Pioneer. Looking for the next big yield breakthrough? Then look to Pioneer. By combining industry-leading R&D with rigorous local testing, what's next happens here at Pioneer. Hey folks, welcome back to Tractor Tales. I tell you what, I'm cold. I want to head to Texas and check out a John Deere 620 in its work clothes. It's loud. <laughs> Local farmer had it here. Uh, I purchased it looking at something just to, just to play with. Uh, being propane, uh, they make good pulling tractors now. They used them on the farms too, but you didn't see them quite as much on on any of the farms it was it was more set up for inside buildings or you know if you had turkey barns or anything like that and this one's supposed to be rated horsepower at at the belt i think is like 50 53 you'll get you'll get a few more horsepower out of propane the compression is higher so you get a, a little bit more horsepower out of it. it has dual hydraulics on it not very many of them that you saw with dual hydraulics they had single hydraulics so for a for a 1958 model machine 
to have dual hydraulics, it, it, it is fairly rare on this. As far as what I have, this is, this is my toy, yes. Well, as we talked about last week on the show, market analysts are pretty bullish when it comes to beef. But, but what is the landscape for cattle producers heading into 2023? Michelle Rook has that in our Farm Journal report next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Well, for months now, the drought has been making headlines across the nation, making analysts bullish on beef prices. Cattlemen have been forced to liquidate their herds due to shortages and high prices for feed as well as water. So what does that mean for the cattle business long term? Michelle Rook joins us now looking at the landscape of the cattle industry. Ty, USD semi-annual cattle inventory report confirmed a 61-year low in the beef cow herd. And barring some major change in the weather, the cattle inventory may not be done shrinking yet. Industry experts predict that could push cattle prices for all classes to record levels yet this year and beyond. The historic drought has been devastating for U.S. cattle producers who have lost years of equity in their operations and genetics in their herds. The liquidation was deepest in the southern plains. This year there's been massive liquidation all over Texas. Um, a lot of the times the folks, the, the farmers and ranchers that have to get rid of everything are the ones that maybe waited too long to lower their numbers, ran out of grass, ran out of water. He says his operation has fared somewhat better, but there is still a scar. We're probably down to about half the number of cows from where we were a couple years ago, which is hard on the wallet, but for sustainability, we have to do that. USDA semi-annual cattle inventory report confirmed the supply shock. All cattle and calves were 89.3 million head, the lowest in eight years, but the beef cow herd was at only 28.9 million, near record low. Kevin Good with Cattle Facts says that herd will continue to contract this year. We're forecasting about a 5% drop in production this year compared to last year. That would equate to about an 800,000 head drop in fed slaughter and about 800,000 head drop in non-fed slaughter as well. As a result, Cattle Facts released some optimistic price projections for all classes of cattle in 2023 and even some record prices by year end based on an increase in retail prices that will trickle down to producers. A 10% increase in fed prices would be a 158 average. On yearlings, eight weights in particular, as we go through the year, we see them moving higher as we get into second half of the year in particular into new crop corn that should be substantially cheaper than it has been this last two years. If that's the case, 195 annual average for an eight weight translates to about a 225 annual average for a five and a half weight steer calf. And Good says this cycle will have a long tail with strong prices all the way out to 2026. That's because there's no sign herd contraction is slowed as there is still no heifer retention. Your, your, your heifers on feed basically are close to 40%, which is the highest percentage it's been since 2000, 2001. So, no, the die is cast on the heifer side that we are liquidating at least through the first half of this year. To stop that trend, cow-calf producers need some help from Mother Nature, namely grass and water. And water's a big, big issue in Texas, especially the further west you go. The other key to encourage rebuilding will be getting profits down to the cow-calf sector, something outgoing NCBA President Don Schiefelbein knows firsthand, but he's encouraged. It looks like we're going to hold our break-evens together this year, which is a positive thing given what we've been through. So I am very confident over the next couple of years, it'll kind of rebound. We'll be back in the black where we need to be, and we'll have that leverage we so desperately needed the last couple of years. There's already a shift in profits away from the record margins packers were seeing the last couple of years, but it will take a while for that to trickle down through the entire supply chain. The packer margin has came down quite a bit, and so hopefully we're evening it out across the board uh, so that everybody can get a little bit of profit because that's what we need. And with additional processing capacity being built, it may exceed supply just as the cattle herd reaches its lowest point, which is a double-edged sword. It's real. But long term, usually once these plants get built, leverage goes to cow-calf producers. And to me, given what we've gone through the last 10 years as cow-calf producers, it's finally time they get their share. Another key for the industry is retaining beef demand in the face of possible higher prices. When you drive down the cow herd too far, 
uh, suddenly the cost of uh, to that American consumer can be astronomical. We don't want that to happen. The hope is beef can continue to gain momentum on the market share it's gained the last 20 years. The dollar growth for beef was more than the dollar growth for both pork and chicken combined in that 20 year period. So demand has been stout. And not just domestically. Beef exports were also a record in 2022, totaling 3.54 billion pounds, up 3% from the previous year, with a value of $11.7 billion, up $1.2 billion. It'll be a new record uh, on volume and value. We're going to be up 3 or 4% on volume, and value is going to come in just under $12 billion in sales, which is easily a record over last year's $10.5 billion. Exports now making up 23% of the value of the beef carcass. And if this continues, it just adds to the optimism of better days ahead for the cattle industry. I'm Michelle Rook for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. Well, demand is still a question mark for beef, but there's also concerns about some other demand. That's what we're talking about with Brian Bastien and Arlen Suderman next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Duracade Viptera. Well, welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Brian Bastien, Arlen Suderman joining us. All right, Brian, on the, the demand side, I mean, it's a mixed bag. Soybean demand better than corn demand, but when you look here in your projections moving forward, where do you think there are some watchouts, and then where do you think there are some areas of opportunity possibly? It's a great question, Tyne. I'd highlight the biggest watchout, if you will, is on corn export demand. We're looking at a very sluggish pace for the first half of the 22-23 crop year for corn. That 1925 USDA export forecast certainly looks vulnerable to the downside in our opinion at this point. A lot of wild cards yet for this last half of the crop year. First and foremost will be the fate of that Brazilian corn crop that they're planting right now because that's going to be a crop that the market's going to be watching exceptionally closely the next two to three months because Brazil, of course, with their new trade agreement with China, is prepared to take over the Chinese market for the most part from the U.S. here as we move into the latter part of 2023. But if obviously if there is a weather problem with that crop, uh, then, then the export demand would remain here with the U.S. But if, underline if, the Brazilian crop is as large as what it potentially could be. The U.S. could lose its number one status as far as the world's top uh, corn exporter. And we could see that old crop carryout, basically that old crop carryout time could edge up significantly from where it is today. I'd remind your viewers that that, that not only that the ethanol uh, usage appears to be a bit overstated, but perhaps that ethanol export is also overstated. Any adjustments to the downside would go directly into the carry out. So that's first and foremost on the watch outs. On the positive side, I think we still have to focus on what happens with China going forward in our relations with China. Well, Arlen, speaking of China, I mean, it's not like tensions or tensions weren't high already, right? The relationship wasn't great. But now with a suspected Chinese spy balloon, the State Department saying this week that they do believe it was used to monitor U.S. communications. Now it seems like those tensions are elevated. Do you think that is a risk when it comes to U.S. exports? Absolutely, it's a risk. Now, how imminent is it? That's that's the big question that we face right now. Uh, longer term, I think China's going to continue to move away from buying from the United States. Uh, they've been buying from us now because they don't have a choice. Brazilian beans are going to be cheaper, first of all. Uh, so they're going to buy everything they can from Brazil. They just haven't had the supply until the harvest. That harvest was delayed, but now they're starting to get those soybeans. Marketing year to date, soybean sales exceed the seasonal pace needed to hit USDA's target by about 65 million bushels. And that's slowly declining now as they shift to Brazilian beans. I think where we're going to hurt is at the tail end of the marketing year when Brazil's going to increase production this year by almost as much as what we shipped to China in all of 2022. So I don't think we're, I think the real pain from the t intensity of the Trade relations with China is going to be felt more next marketing year, maybe at the end of this marketing year into the next marketing year on the soybean side. I do think on a positive side, we're going to see them buy more corn than expected, even with Brazil's big uh, corn crop that they have. I think the short Argentine corn crop and the lack of Ukraine production this year, as well as the limited ability to export is going to help save us on the corn side. I still agree that it's going to be hard to hit USD's current target, but that's going to keep it from being as bad as what it could be. 
Um, but longer term, we're going to miss that Chinese trade and why we need to continue to focus on other markets and then developing our domestic demand, uh, which the biofuels is helping. But, you know, I don't know if they can get there in time before we. Arlen, Brian, thank you so much for joining us this weekend. Stay with us because we'll have much more right here on U.S. Farm Report. And even the science behind the turf used at the Super Bowl. That story is next. Your next piece of equipment is on MachineryPete.com. Search equipment from dealerships across the country to find what you're looking for. Only on MachineryPete.com. Well, I don't know about you, but being in Kansas City, I'm pretty excited for the big game this weekend as the Kansas City Chiefs and Philadelphia Eagles are facing off in the Super Bowl. But the field on which each team will play actually plays a very important role in the big game. And it's the science behind that turf that has roots at Oklahoma State University. SunUp TV's Lyndall Stout has that story. Oklahoma State University's Turfgrass Research Center is once again in the national spotlight, this time for Super Bowl 57. Tahoma 31, developed by OSU scientists, was selected for the playing field at State Farm Stadium in Glendale, Arizona. Turf grass breeding program really has focused on developing varieties that are tough. Tahoma 31 is also resilient, has a fine texture, darker green color, and can handle drought, cold, and shade. Plant breeder Dr. Yan Shi Wu is on the turf development team. Not many Bermuda grass see the shade tolerance, but it is Tahoma 31. So all these components put together make this grass is robust in many aspects. A new turf grass variety takes 10 to 15 years to research and develop. The extensive testing takes place in the greenhouse, the lab, and in the field. The best variety is then patented and released commercially. We have no involvement in the selling of the product itself. It's just simply the development of it to uh, really try to solve specific problems. So uh, let's say, for instance, this year we had a very tough drought year. And so we have some grasses that have some specific characteristics that really handle the drought very well, like perhaps an enhanced root system. Dr. Dennis Martin is an OSU Extension turf grass specialist on the team. So the grass is performing, uh, and uh, as long as it continues to perform, uh, I think we'll see it on those facilities. And, and at the same time, we've got the next generations of materials in the pipeline that are experimental to be rolled out. Turf grass breeding programs were originally developed in order to develop forages for cattle and sheep uh, to, you know, to, for food production. But in the process, we learned a lot about how grasses behave and different kinds of grasses. And lo and behold, it turns out Bermuda grass is a tremendous grass for playing surfaces. And great for advancing science. Very proud uh, when you start thinking about uh, the reach that we have for our turf grass. We have it in Soldier Field, but we also have it at Churchill Downs. We have it at the Capitol Building in Washington, D.C. Uh, and then to have it in two playoff games, uh, two different ones, and then the Super Bowl, I don't know if anybody could ever claim that they had plant material that people were playing on and the performance of that, that's really astounding. Bottom line, even though the game has yet to be played, Oklahoma State is already a winner. For Oklahoma State University, I'm Lyndall Stout. Thanks, Lyndall. A little ag ankle in the Super Bowl. Well, USDA cut ethanol demand in its latest report, but John Phipps looks into ethanol use next. Ukraine and U.S. food prices. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Golden Harvest. Broad adaptability, high yield potential, solid agronomics, great late season health. The foundations of a successful season start with Golden Harvest Game Changing Corn. Find your hybrid at GameChangingCorn.com. Well, more than a decade ago, food versus fuel was a very hot topic. But even as the science showed ethanol is not a food versus fuel debate, why is the topic resurfacing now? Here's John Phipps. A question about ethanol and food prices. The ethanol industry has largely debunked food versus fuel. 
But with world shortages of grain due to drought and the Ukraine war, won't usage of corn for ethanol drive up prices of food at the grocery store for consumers? And that's from David Glory in Petoskey, Michigan. Thanks for the question. It turned out to be a little trickier than to nail down uh, with least pinpoint accuracy. Although I am not a fan of the food dollar series since it implies more than it informs, it's a good place to start. The USD has just announced that the farm share of the food dollar just set a new low record in 22, 14 and a half cents. Corn generates about 16% of all farm cash receipts, so a rough guess would be corn is about 2% of the food dollar. If we subtract the 40% of corn used for ethanol, it would be an even rougher figure of about one cent per food dollar. Regardless, food prices are slightly and slowly influenced by corn prices. Corn is used for feed, fuel, export, and a little directly for food. Think Fritos. As for supplies and shortages, there's really nothing to see here. The tragedy of the Ukraine war has not been a serious blow to grain trade since there are many other producers. Ironically, Russia has selflessly stolen Ukrainian markets, making up for lower UKR wheat output with their own exports while invading. This chart was made in July, and the current estimate for Ukrainian exports for the 22-23 year is about 30 million metric tons, which I think is remarkable. Overall, USDA estimate estimates supplies of all grains are sufficient even with significant Ukrainian losses. Our market experts can give more exact figures, but a drop of 30 million tons from 790 would be hard to detect in prices. This is, of course, terrible news for Ukraine, but has had less effect on global trade than many expected. The natural conditions of production have far more impact. Food price inflation here was driven by many factors, supply chain costs and interruptions, drought, transportation problems, the pandemic demand shift from food away from home and restaurants to grocery stores, all of which are still selling out. Outside impacts like avian flu or conflict or logistical interruption, especially for more perishable commodities, which corn is not, can trigger sharp price spikes, but we are now seeing almost as rapid reversals. In short, I worry about Ukrainian people, not U.S. food or ethanol supply. Supplies. Thanks, John, and stay with us because we're continuing to celebrate the Super Bowl and find the ag angle. That's from the farm next. Well, a few dairy farmers are getting in the Super Bowl spirit this weekend, cheering on their hometown team in their own way. From red and yellow cheese curds in Kansas City to Missouri-based Chateau Milk Company producing this Chief's Red Velvet Milk, dairies were busy gearing up for the big game in their own unique way this week. Chateau Milk Company is creating a winning tradition with both Chief's cheese and milk, all to cheer on the Chiefs. And on the Kansas side, check out dairy farmer Rob Leach's work of art. He took spreading manure on a field to a whole new level, spreading that manure into the number 15 in honor of who else but Chiefs quarterback Patrick Mahomes. Leach says with no GPS, he freehanded the numbers. Satisfied with what he's calling his crappy creation, he put a call out on Facebook for an aerial photo, and a stranger answered the call, taking this photo from 400 feet up. Leach wanted to make the numbers large enough to see from the sky. After all, Leach's farm is in the flight path from Kansas City to Phoenix. Fly, Eagles, fly. But it's not just dairy farmers in Kansas City celebrating. Jared Kurtz of Kirkland Farms is located only an hour from Philadelphia. So naturally, the lifelong dairy farmer is also a lifelong Eagles fan. I have memories so back in the late 90s. The Eagles weren't uh, the best team at that point. And I was, you know, I was growing up 10, 12 years old. And, and when they didn't sell out games, they would, use the, they would block out the games on TV. But I have memories of sitting by the radio, listening to the games. Kurt says they average about a calf a day being born on the farm. So with calves born over the past two weeks, the family decided to have some fun when choosing their names. The names that we primarily <sighs> came up with were offensive linemen, but that was just kind of a coincidence. Um, the biggest one that we were, were fans of were milk. It was Milkerson, named after uh, Landon Dickerson. 
Dickerson is a fan favorite at their farm. The Philadelphia Eagles guard is a fuel up to play 60 supporter and ambassador, even participating in a photo shoot with Kirkland Farms this year. We actually went and did a photo shoot with him. Our family did back in uh, back in December. So that was great. He's an awesome, awesome guy and big, big fans. As for the other Caps, well, they're also named after the Eagles offensive line. We had Kelsey named after Jason Kelsey. Mulata, which was named after Jordan Mulata. Uh, Salmamu, which is named after Isaac Salmamu. There's no question who this dairy farm will be cheering for this weekend. As Kurt says, these baby calves have already stolen the hearts of Eagles fans all around the area. Should be a good game this weekend. All right, that does it for U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Be sure to tune in next weekend as we work to build on our tradition as we're actually on the road. We will be doing the show from the National Farm Machinery Show. So if you're headed to National Farm Machinery Show, be sure, sure to join us Thursday, 2 o'clock, as we have our live U.S. Farm Report taping. Thanks for joining us, and have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.